The meeting is called to order. This is Saturday, January 22nd, 2022, and it is the Henrico County Board of Supervisors retreat. And I know that means we're backing up, but what we're doing is learning new material and we will be going over many topics today. Um, let's see, first, very first order of business is to say happy birthday to the manager's wife, oh, Jenny Batolka. I hope she's watching today. <laughs> Now, the, the manager will be bringing you a very nice dinner tonight from your favorite restaurant. <laughs> um, we have many items that we're going to be discussing, dis discussing some formally and some informally. And I think I might take off my mask and it, I won't be so muffled. We are sitting rather far apart, as you can see. Um, Today, we will be working and talking with the school board, the economic development strategy or economic development authority. We're going to talk to the planning department about our comprehensive plan update, um, major utility asset planning. I know we might get into Cobbs Creek some, but there's some other things we also do need to talk about. Real property assessments, which is going to be interesting. Uh, about a bond referendum that we are planning for this November. Uh, and then talking a bit about our budget, but during budget week, which is in mid-March, we spend four to five days seriously going over just about every item. So we have a lot to cover today. I also want to mention um, possible discussion about skateboard park and um, some other things. Um, that might come up during the day. Uh, if you do have questions, there is a chat area where if you have some questions, we, I could check on them uh, in between presentations and I might be able to get in some of the questions from those people who are watching this morning uh, remotely. So welcome to everyone. Um, and I do have one question that, but Mr. Manager, you were going to start off going over some things and welcoming, but I will, I do want to mention that I received, uh, got about 10 uh, emails over the course of yesterday afternoon. Very quickly, I received about 4 phone calls last night after after hours and they were from people who had heard. Uh, not just teachers, some were teachers, some were people in the neighborhoods. And uh, they had heard uh, that this was only a meeting with the Board of Supervisors and the school board, which is why I wanted to point out this is a, a, a discussion of many topics today. But um, their concern was about masks. Some like the mask idea of the children with masks and some did not. So the one issue that I was hoping we could get a, just a clarification on from the uh, school superintendent, and I could mention this to her. Mr. Manager, now it's up to you if you will give us your welcome. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, uh, I also, uh, Ms. Shea is chair of the school board, Dr. Cashwell, members of the school board, members of staff. I want to thank everyone. You know, this is a Saturday, and the fact that we are working all day on a Saturday to chart the uh, course for the next year, I think is a significant undertaking of uh, personal time. So I begin with simply a thank you for all members of the board. You now you have uh, undertaken these annual retreats for a number of years, and there's a lot of work product that has come out of them. You know, at the end of the year, we report out at the state of the county, and many times I've heard, you know, that was a lot that we did uh, this year as a staff, and ultimately it comes about from efforts like this that give us the staff. Basically, uh, the guide for the next year, you are going to be looking at a lot of new uh, proposals, efforts, possibilities, if you will, particularly when you look at uh, uh, some of what Dr. Cashwell, uh, Anthony Romanello are, uh, bring forward. And uh, when you get into utilities, uh, you'll hear about a new proposal uh, to extend uh, utilities to a number of our residents. I'll save the, uh, the budget conversation uh, for last, but we begin, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, with the most important uh, component of our general government, and that is uh, our school system and Dr. Cashwell. So without further ado, Dr. Cashwell. 
you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, Chair O'Bannon, Vice Chair Thornton, members of the board, Mr. Manager, and um, I am so pleased to be able to be joined both in person and virtually uh, by our chair and vice chair. I can see Chair Shea, Vice Chair Kinsella is here in the room, all other members of our board um, also present virtually, as well as uh, a large contingent of our staff who are true champions of some incredible work happening in Henrico County Public Schools. And I'm gonna provide an overview of some topics that have been in the works for quite a while as this agenda has formed up uh, for purposes of the retreat. And while it certainly doesn't represent everything that's happening in Henrico County Public Schools, I think it really hit some highlights and particularly um, highlights where there are some great synergies between uh, the two bodies, the, the Board of Supervisors and the School Board. And so uh, we continue to be so proud of what we've accomplished together on behalf of the Henrico Schools community. And so I'm going to start uh, in that vein of a thank you. Oops. There we go. Uh, by doing some celebrating briefly. And so you can see some outcomes here that are truly representative of the incredible investment, not only uh, fiduciary investments of so the investment this board and our school board have continued to make in our students uh, has resulted in some tremendous outcomes. So let's just take a peek at the class of 2021 specifically. Uh, no one can argue they faced some unusual and incredible challenges, but boy, that did not stop them. You can see an outstanding on-time graduation rate. $21.4 million accepted in scholarships. That doesn't even begin to represent the number of offers that were received. This is what was actually accepted. Um, a large, more than half of our students earning advanced diplomas, not standard diplomas, but advanced diplomas uh, for graduation here. And then you can also see that our graduates, 71% uh, plan to continue their education. So whether they're enrolled, uh, enlisted, or employed in an opportunity where they're going to continue to grow and learn and, and earn industry certification, we're just so proud of those numbers. And then uh, we also awarded 2,408 career and technical education credentials, and just the credentials there uh, where individuals are graduating ready and equipped with the skills needed to be proficient in any number of areas. Super proud of the incredible um, talented professionals uh, that we have across our teaching force, and 32 new National Board Certified Teachers joined the ranks of that highest distinction and professional honor. Uh, we are ranked number one in the state for the number of National Board Certified Teachers in this group, uh, and, at, and, and fairly high nationally as well, so really proud of uh, the way our team has supported our teachers in working towards this incredible professional designation. I think it speaks volumes about the talent in the workforce we have. Uh, really, again, proud of the number of uh, county achievement awards, uh, both at the national and Virginia level. I know we had a chance to celebrate those together at a joint meeting. Really proud of that. Continue to be named one of the best communities uh, for music education. I think, again, that speaks volumes of the work we do, not just in the academic, but those wraparounds to support uh, our students. And excited that so far, we're not done yet. We've got four state athletic championships titles uh, for this school year. Really proud of our Deep Run High School Girls Cross Country, Glen Allen High School Boys Cross Country, Glen Allen High School Boys Volleyball, and Verina High School Football. So incredibly proud of those athletes for this tremendous accomplishment at the state championship level. Look forward to continuing to celebrate them as well and see if that list grows a bit. Got some outstanding uh, athletes. So uh, as Chair O'Bannon mentioned, we're gonna cover some broad territory here with schools. Uh, one of those areas is taking a look at current capital plans, sort of how we are um, handling projects now and taking a long look to the future, including some discussion on potential bond projects, as well as looking at what's uh, underway right now. Um, and so uh, we'll kind of segue from that into some upcoming new high school programming. And then we'll also uh, take a look at community learning center projects that are underway, as well as um, some teacher and staff rec recruitment and retention. So we're going to cover a lot of territory. 
Um, and I, again, am joined by the incredible team uh, who put this presentation together, and hopefully I can do it justice. But they're here to answer in-depth questions as well. So our capital improvement plan, um, as you've seen, covers three big areas, our facilities, transportation, and technology. We're going to focus on facilities today. Um, so this slide represents all of our school construction by the decade. You can see our um, incredible inventory of learning facilities here. And the highlighted ones have all uh, either been renovated or that's the yellow or um, have had, of course, some rebuilds or expansions. And you can see those in uh, sort of the green color there. So the schools that are not highlighted are the ones that um, have not been touched, if you will, other than potentially meals tax projects and other enhancements. And you'll see all of those schools represented in our CIP um, as we have, again, a plan to tackle some current needs and then look to the future to kind of get us through all of that, um, through that entire list. So current projects going on right now, you may be familiar that we're beginning that Adams project. That was uh, one of the last projects on the, uh, the last bond list. So that's underway, thrilled to be underway with our um, expansion and renovation project for the career and technical centers. That was an outstanding outcome for the work of these two boards together, school board and board of supervisors, prioritizing the needs of career and technical education at Henrico. Uh, we had long lamented the fact that we had more students, almost a thousand more students interested in enrolling those pro in those programs than we had seats. So, uh, and then of course, wanting to make sure the programs are cutting edge, up to date with equipment and facility. This project is going to tackle that. Uh, those are underway. And also really pleased that the campus of Virginia Randolph, which had long been a priority unfunded on our CIP, um, has been expedited by the ability to leverage some ESSER uh, funds for specifically for this very important project. And then, of course, uh, looking again, thinking about that list of, of, of projects yet tackled, you can see a number of them reflected here uh, in what's developing and shaping up as potential next projects that could be um, covered through a bond. And I know we've discussed these before again bringing our inventory of aging schools up to date, but also uh, making room for growth with some new elementary projects, uh, both at the Fairfield area and the West End area, as well as thinking about continuing to expand programming to make sure that we are offering uh, cutting edge programming. And you'll see that with the environmental education building listed there. And then looking back up uh, past that bond, there are a number of projects which we've already uh, included in our pre planning study Carver, Three Chop, Dumbarton, and Hermitage, which would be sort of next in that priority list order once you get past that bond list. Um, and so, you know, we would, as we again take that long range look out to about 29, 32 fiscal years, those are uh, would be the next projects. And, oh, We'll see myself there. And then following that list, not yet studied, uh, but the next in order by age are listed here on the slide. Uh, Donahoe, Glen Allen, Rolf, Godwin High School, and Gaten Elementary. And so uh, if you think about that original list I showed you by the decades, that takes us all the way through the list with uh, Gaten being a 1980s project. So that would, um, by the time we would get to fiscal year 32, take us uh, through that entire uh, inventory of projects there. So that gives you an idea of how we're um, tackling current needs and looking to the future. So the campus of Virginia Randolph want to provide a quick update there. You can see a timeline uh, for this project that's underway here on the slide. So projecting that uh, new facility to open 2024. And just a quick look. Oh. There you go. Uh, as a reminder that this project is incredibly important because much of our specialized programming is currently and will be housed uh, on this campus. And of course, we know there's a historic legacy to be honored here. And so all of the project plans underway endeavor to make sure there is a state of the art facility for teaching and learning that meets the needs of specialized programs. Some uh, exceptional education programs, some alternative education, uh, as well as some career and technical threads you'll see present uh, in the in the programming there. Um, and of course, continuing to honor the legacy of Virginia Randolph 
herself. And so uh, really excited about this project and the momentum that's picking up there. The ACE programs, as I mentioned, that incredible investment in career and technology, uh, uh, career and technical education, rather, uh, adding new seats, right? So I mentioned we have so much interest here, and this is an incredible opportunity for students to be a part of these courses. We saw the number of industry certifications, uh, and that was a number that wowed us, I think, a little bit at the start of the presentation. Imagine that number growing exponentially as we are able to offer more seats to students, really preparing them. Uh, with industry certifications in hand, a uh, lot of workforce experience as they're um, with us in high school. So adding new seats and of course, new space for uh, future programs. And you can see a timeline there, both for Hermitage and Highland Springs ACE here uh, with those renovations and expansions. Again, looking to open all of those spaces by the fall of 2023. So we're on track there. And again, just as a reminder here, you can see all kinds of uh, new course offerings that will be made possible by this new space. It covers the gamut, right? So you see anything from bioengineering to uh, geospatial technology, food science and dietetics. And I know you've heard presentations um, before that really talk about how these programs at both Hermitage and Highland Springs are really aligned to the business communities nearby, right? So it's not just about the learning that will happen on site at the ACE centers, but the synergies with the business partners in the, the local area, providing those internships, job shadow experiences, all of those hands-on pieces. So you can see that's an incredible uh, list that we'll be able to add as we um, finish out this expansion. Also thinking about all of our high school programming beyond the career and technical piece, we know that um, we have had the unique opportunity over the past few years to begin rethinking the high school experience to make sure we're better meeting the needs of students today for a future many of us can't imagine. So that's changing rapidly. So we can't just prepare students to graduate and uh, tackle what we know today, but to be really global citizens prepared to be critical thinkers, problem solvers for whatever uh, awaits them post-graduation. So we talk about this notion of life-ready students, and that's what our high school redesign work has been about. Uh, two of the projects that are born from high school redesign, if you will, are two new specialty centers that are coming on board. One uh, is the Center for Environmental Science and Sustainability that will be open in the fall. We're taking applications now. I've uh, been advertising these new opportunities to students. This will be um, housed at Verina High School with the opportunity to have some satellite on-site learning out in the field all across uh, the beautiful Verina area. Um, and will, of course, include the opportunity to learn at the uh, new living building should that come to life. Uh, as is proposed in that bond list. So uh, students would be learning on site at Verina High School, out in the field in the Verina area, as well as at that living building. And so what's the purpose of the center? Well, it's really to use the outdoors for this experiential learning, as well as uh, study what is a, a cutting edge and growing area that is uh, you know, there's so much demand in the workforce right now for individuals who have expertise in any number of fields that fall under that environmental science umbrella, and it's a vast umbrella. Um, so you can imagine anything from drone technologies to reforestry to uh, the list is endless, but uh, really exciting opportunities there. Jump ahead. You can see again why Verina. Uh, look at the incredible natural resources in that area that will be right there at the fingertips of students to get out in the field um, and experience um, hands on learning as they're digging into a number of environmental science topics. And already have some great partners on board. You can see businesses and partners here. So really embedding not just classroom learning, but a, that workforce experience, those work based um, learning experiences uh, will be numerous. And you can see all kinds of examples there. But notice the Henrico County government seal there with the solar project. Think of uh, recreation and parks and all of the opportunities our folks will have to partner up as we've done in a number of ways so far, but really expanding those work-based learning experiences. 
Also opening the Allied Health and Human Service Center. This is another growing area in industry, the, the health and medical field. Um, and one of the highest demand areas when we look at current specialty center and ACE center offerings, I know you've heard Mac Baton share before, this is one of the highest demand where we've had the fewest number of seats in that health and medical. So this will also, um, in addition to our career and technical expansion, seeing this new center come to life will really allow students who have this interest uh, to dig deeper into this incredibly uh, in demand field. Very much like you saw with the environmental studies, this is the hands on learning very different than some of our other specialty centers and that students can be earning dual enrollment credit uh, while they're in high school. So they're graduating not only with um, this great learning experience, but probably with industry certifications in hand dual enrollment credit in hand um, and having experienced uh, some sort of a. Uh, an internship or work based learning experience. And again, the location there at Hermitage High School is proximal to a number of facilities who will be great partners uh, in learning for that hands on experience. You can see uh, some some uh, places listed there on the map. Is it, oh, okay. I'm, I'm fighting this box. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, is it going to advance? Sure. Clinic. <laughs> Stuck now. There we go. And you can see some great partners here um, already on tap to handle some of that work phase, workforce development piece, uh, the job shadowing, all of that. Great partners here. I know that list will continue to grow. Uh, but considering we've not even opened the doors to students yet, I think it's a pretty impressive partner list because there's so much interest in the business community um, in helping create these experiences for students uh, who will be great employees uh, one day out in, in our community or beyond. So that kind of covers um, new programming. I also want to cover some territory here about our community learning centers. You may have heard some talk about this uh, newly developing strategy. And so I'm um, going to hit on this for a little bit. So what is a community school? And I know that we think, well, all schools are community schools because they're right here in our community. So, yes. Sure. Back one. I'd be happy to. Sir. Two. Two. Yes. So, and uh, I'm really excited about this. Absolutely excited about it. And and we have on the general government side something that we're we're hopefully in the bond referendum will pass as well, which um, I'd like you to just take note and somehow work into uh, your bottom slide. Uh, we have a a, a no kill uh, animal facility that we're that we're planning to bring forward. Uh, and that would be excellent if we can get schools involved in that as well. Absolutely. We will take note that that's an, a great, a great thought. Um, and I think you'll see it come on the list. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping up with you. And I was like, should I talk to her about that? No, I'm I, glad I, you I shouldn't interrupt. I shouldn't, I said, no, no, I'm, I'm glad you did. And I know I'm racing <laughs> through this and then we'll have, a, I want to leave a lot of time for discussion and questions. And so um, I know I've probably uh, racing through here at work. I promise I'll, I'll drink some more <laughs> coffee and I'll jump in faster. <laughs> that's, all, that's all right. Uh, I'm not using good wait time like our teachers do in our classrooms. They're a lot better at that, I think, than I am. But again, this idea of a community school, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this because this is something we've, uh, this is a project we're really excited about in Henrico County Public Schools, but I know is uh, easily misunderstood because we think all schools are community schools and they are indeed embedded in our community. But when we're talking about our community school uh, projects that are underway, I want you to imagine sort of hubs throughout the community that are located in schools and school centers and sort of spokes, if you will, coming off those hubs to other schools that offer uh, wraparound services for students and allow um, sometimes things from the community to come into the school. So that's this idea of community schools, partnerships, synergies. Think of anything from 
um, you know, adult learning to family learning, early childhood development, health and social services, all a lot of things that are available in the community kind of coming together in a hub to meet the demand of whatever that community's needs might be. And we know every community's needs are a little bit different, so they're very customizable. Want me to go back? Okay. No, I was going to ask Victoria a question. Okay. We have anyone in the chat room that's asking questions, and mm -hmm. how many people do we have now? Sixty-nine. Okay, thank you. So um, there are a lot of reasons why, and, and certainly at the top of that list is to provide better service to our students and families. But when we think about some other reasons why, this uh, opportunity will allow for a little more cross-agency collaboration. I think that is a, a crown jewel of, of highlights for uh, things Henrico County does well. The synergy between uh, systems is incredible. I think this allows us to build on that even more when you think about the proximity of some of our mental health services, social services, and other wraparounds. Uh, allows us to be a little more lean, a little more strategic in the way we offer services to our communities uh, and our communities all through Henrico uh, across the magisterial districts. And uh, Henrico leads the way. And so we were, we are one of the first localities in the state who are really looking to bring this model to fruition. We've had to travel out of state as we've been learning about um, how to make this work, but it is a nationally researched model. Um, and there's a lot of grant funding right now available for these kinds of projects. And so we've been taking advantage of that. And as I mentioned, you can imagine we're, we're planning some hubs, which would be a larger uh, a site community learning center that would have lots of services and then spokes would be uh, services available at individual schools. So I'm going to give you an example of a spoke. Maybe you got to hear about our Glen uh, Lee Elementary telehealth clinic that opened recently. Think of that as a spoke, like a satellite. So that's a specific need for that school. Uh, when we look at ab um, absenteeism and attendance data, thinking about the needs of that particular school, bringing in this telehealth option allows us to keep more students in school learning um, by uh, partnership uh, with VCU Children's Health and uh, Dental to be able to really create instant, uh, if you will, on-site access to healthcare. So uh, perhaps a child has an ear infection and they might have had the, you know, the nurse, the school nurse who's on-site can see the child's presenting those symptoms, but not being a physician, uh, with the parent's permission, would be able to bring in telehealth. Um, they are able to take vital signs of the student right there, and it's all that data is transferred to the doctor. I think during uh, COVID, we all learned a lot more about telehealth, so that's possible. And then um, this is a situation where perhaps the doctor's already going to be able to call in that prescription. The parent's going to be able to pick up the child. Maybe uh, the work schedule would have prevented them uh, from getting easily to a doctor. Maybe uh, they might uh, not be insured and would have been spending time in our emergency rooms to get service for something like an ear infection that could be handled very quickly, um, treatment more quickly, and hopefully back in school learning more quickly. So this is our first of what we hope will be many other telehealth uh, clinic opportunities and other spoke style services. And then coming back to this idea of a hub, we will be opening our first hub or full, full service center in what is going to be called the Oak Avenue Complex, which is the old Highland Springs High School. So rather than having the new Highland Springs High School and the old Highland Springs High School, uh, there's been a team uh, getting feedback on how we can rebrand that incredible property. Uh, they've rebranded it the Oak Avenue Complex because obviously of its location on Oak, but also to pay uh, homage to the history of the Oak and the strength of the roots and this idea of of an incredible place that brings together valuable resources. So that's one of the things that will be housed there uh, in the school. All right, and the last topic I'm going to touch on, of course, is um, recruitment and retention. So there's no uh, secret that there's a staffing shortages and labor shortages in every industry. You may know that the um, K-12 public education was facing some of this staffing crisis lead even before the pandemic. Um, so you can imagine the pandemic has exacerbated some of those woes that has not stopped our efforts. I think you'll be really pleased if you take a look at our baseline year uh, related to recruiting and retaining of the 2018-19 school year. 
year that we've actually been able to retain uh, more staff and have had less turnover. So we've actually seen uh, improvement there. And so I want to start by saying thank you, because I think one of the recruitment and retention strategies is certainly being competitive uh, when it comes to our pay scale. And we're able to be a region leader, uh, very competitive in this area because of the continued investment um, in, in our employees that have been made uh, by this board and our school board. And so you can see the results. Uh, there and, and so I know compensation is 1, 1 piece of the puzzle, but it does make a difference. And so um, wanted to be able to share that as well as some other strategies that are underway to make sure that we continue to be an employer of distinction, a desired uh, workplace uh, in the region. <clears throat> Not just because of competitive salaries and that we're also recruiting talent. So we've recently brought on a talent acquisition ambassador thinking about our human resources function, um, even in a different way to make sure we're proactively um, <clears throat> recruiting and making sure that our programs um, are enticing to those who would want to join. Uh, our workforce and so lots of pipeline supports as well. These are grants to help with teacher preparation programs, perhaps individuals who are currently employed with us, helping them get advanced degrees. So we're really doing a lot in this area with our higher ed partners and grants um, to really support those who might be in school wanting to become teachers, as well as those who are currently employed with us. Uh, for example, instructional assistants being able to particularly uh, earn degrees in special ed if they want to become teachers, those kinds of things. And then salary advancement and career development, career ladders. Uh, we've been working to develop that over time. Really excited that we'll be able to begin to launch that um, as we had planned to uh, just before the pan pandemic. And I know we, we took a prudent approach uh, fiscally over that time, but are prepared to launch the career ladder, which I think will only continue to enhance enhance our efforts here. So, Dr. Cashwell, this is a um, significant development. This is something the board will recall started with the compression analysis that, um, that we did collectively and the fact that, and we have career development uh, steps in just about every general government agency. And the fact that you're able to do this for our school system, I think for uh, instruction, if I'm not mistaken, you're going to be one of the few in the state or maybe leading this effort. Yeah, it's our um, understanding that we may be leading the effort in the state. And while certainly there are some things that have similarities to the career ladder that we've been doing, and I know other um, school divisions do, for example, some additional compensation for national board certification, or you earn a professional designation and there's some sort of a monetary support to that. This really expands um, that notion uh, beyond just national board or beyond just even the teaching rank with ranks when we think about all the other professionals, um, our licensed school psychologists and so on within each of those fields are also these high level designations that individuals um, can earn. And so making sure that we're compensating that uh, through the ladder, that's really an exciting uh, uh, venture for us because I think it, it broadens the scope, it touches more employees and then also um, recognizing a lot of the professional learning that goes on um, all the time with our teachers and the investments they make in going above and beyond to become more proficient at a particular area. And that benefits their students and the student outcomes. Um, and so being able to reward that as teachers work to earn particular professional designations, even inside Henrico schools, becoming a master teacher at uh, one area or another. So, um, you know, this has the, this ladder while we're kind of, you know, starting a little more conservatively, looking at particular employee groups, starting with our professional employees, it will grow to be able to touch all employees. How is how are the teachers and, and staff taking to it? Are they embracing and excited to do it or has there been any pushback or non-interest? Well, you know, we first launched the idea uh, just a few years ago, kind of pre pandemic had a lot of interest. Our teacher advisory committees and other committees that um, stakeholder committees who were involved in 
uh, sort of the soft launch efforts. We're really excited about it. And there was uh, quite a sigh of disappointment when we said we've got to put that on pause. Everyone certainly understood. And there seems to be a lot of ex excitement about bringing it back. And of course, between then and now, we've really been able to rethink some pieces and I think make it even stronger than it would have been had it launched uh, initially. So that pause was helpful in some ways. And, um, you know, we certainly are going to continue to um, help our employees understand what this means and how it's a benefit. And it's not in place of regular employee compensation increases. So, you know, I think people uh, who are employed with us understand the county's commitment to compensating employees well. I think the longevity increases. Every employee got at least a 6.9% increase over the, the last uh, budget. So they see that um, Henrico County is serious about investing in its people and to understand that this is an additional layer, not in lieu of regular compensation increases, is incredibly positive news for employees. And hopefully um, when, when folks are thinking about which uh, school system to join, they, uh, this will be uh, certainly a, a carrot we can dangle and that will retain some of our top employees who are who are growing professionally and taking on these additional certifications and things to. Uh, that's that's what I was going to mention, because when we were talking about compression being such an issue and talking about retention in, in the schools, as well as other departments, um, the latter or rear development is is in my opinion, key because you're investing in your future and you're, you're expanding your future. So it should quadruple your retention. Can I give you one warning though? As soon as this is perfect and lined up, I'm sure Chesterfield will release this and say that it was their concept. <laughs> <laughs> it could happen. I yeah, we're we're very used to it. I just wanted to give you in schools a warning. And I think a, a, a warning received. And I think another uh, positive element is the amount of employee choice and autonomy in something like a ladder. There's a lot of opportunity for employees to kind of build out their progression on the ladder in a way that meets their unique needs. So I think that's another uh, hallmark of that. So that covers. Is there any other questions? Um, a lot of territory. And so I not only am I happy to answer questions about all the, the number of topics we've covered so far. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the incredible team responsible for all the work uh, in putting these projects together. So um, kind of going backwards, our human resources team, Francine Bolden and Kenya Jackson, our new talent acquisition ambassador, are on here virtually on the WebEx. Um, incredible in leading those efforts. Of course, um, Lenny Pritchard is here with me, and he and Susan have been leading the way with their CIP work in that long-range planning and really moving us forward as an organization. You can see um, Adrienne Cole Johnson, Family and Community Engagement, is with us. She's leading the Community Learning Center work and has really been instrumental in just really increasing um, our family and community engagement footprint all across Henrico County. So incredibly proud of the work there. And then um, Dr. Ingrid Grant, our chief of schools, uh, Thomas Farrell and Mac Baton, incredible team leading um, our work. And, oh, and Mike Taylor, I, admit, I didn't see him there earlier and I wanted to make sure he was still there. I should point him out as well. Uh, our education foundation. There is no doubt that the community learning center projects and the Glenlee telehealth clinic would not have launched without the support of our and championing of our education foundation. Mike Taylor um, has been an incredible partner in this work and, and will continue to be a vital part of what's possible going forward uh, with our expansion. Um, and then I was introducing before I saw Mike, uh, thinking about our high school redesign work and our career and technical work. You all know Mac Baton and Dr. Thomas Farrell has presented, uh, I believe before for this, um, this body and really championing that high school redesign and all of our new programs that are coming on board. So uh, they represent um, an incredible team making these uh, opportunities happen. And so I wanted to point them out as well. And then particularly as questions come up, We've got a lots of experts here and hopefully we can answer uh, any questions you have. Yeah, are there any questions from members of the board? I'll, I'll get a few. So I got quite a few on um, Dr. Cashworth. Um, aren't you list for new schools? How are we uh, coming 
you know, how we come along with the, um, I know we opened, we were kind of pushing to make sure that we had um, at least the minimum to get us open. How we now, I guess, January, and I guess I'm asking in particular about Highland Springs, but be curious to hear about Tucker too. Yes, the punch list is coming along and it's a process that we're continuing to work on. In some cases, um, you know, just like everything else, there's a, a demand on some of the items that we that needed to go in, that should go in. Um, that, that continues to be somewhat of a challenge, but it is coming along and it's continued to, to, to go through and work through those those aspects of it. So okay. they're coming along. If um uh if I'm out in the street running to somebody, they bring up a point that I just need to reach out to you. Yes, please do. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cash, well, you brought up the Oak Avenue complex. Really great, um, great idea. I I I saw a picture. Of, um, so it looks like the uh, the A Center Achievable Dream and. Assuming the, the full service community school will run in um, partnership with the Michael Education Foundation. Yeah, so along with a number of other partners. So that community learning center hub and um, Adrian, please chime in to add any other thoughts and Mike as well uh, is currently under development. Adrian's had a number of meetings to get stakeholder feedback throughout the community about what would you like to see here? Things from uh, after school tutoring opportunities to adult and family education, family services, family supports. Um, so they're working together to try to think about what do we need to bring on site to this location, mental health supports have, were a big need in the community. And so um, uh, certainly through not only funding that's made possible by the Education Foundation, but their work and garnering partnerships and funders and uh, sort of like you know, getting VCU health to the table for a Glen Lake Clinic is, a, is an ongoing um, effort. So. Does that cover it? Yes, that, that covers it. And I'll just jump in to add, we've been very intentional about connecting with all stakeholders. We started in the community really last summer and connected across um, Henrico County, but spent a lot of time in Verona and Fairfield hearing from the community. Um, we've been very closely connected to Henrico agencies as well. Um, Monica Smith Callahan has been instrumental in making sure that we're connected to various um, Department heads, we were just on a human services call yesterday. And so now we're doing that deeper dive. In addition to identifying and highlighting the rich um, group of nonprofits that are also based here in Henrico to see how we can support with streamlining um, wraparound services. Thank you. So the, the target for, are you looking at fall 22, spring 23? What's the target to, be in the building with all three programs up and running. I guess. You know, I think, um, you know, they each separately kind of have their own timelines based on their own unique needs. But as far as the community learning center piece, well, we are doing some uh, physical improvements to the building and some security enhancements and those kinds of things are underway now, making sure that understanding there would kind of be some unique programming across the building, uh, that the building is situated for that. So. Uh, we're making an investment in that right now in, in time and, and resources to make sure it's adequately prepared to take those programs on. But, you know, the Community Learning Center, I would say, you know, as it originally launches, hopefully as we approach the spring, actually being able to open the doors there, it will continue to grow and expand. But hopefully we can start by at least getting some core pieces of that hub up and running. And then you saw the timeline there for um, ACE, the ACE expansion. And so they'll be working through that. And then, you know, understanding that each program has its unique needs and kind of working through what makes sense and, and, and being flexible about that. So, um, and I, I don't want to get stuck on this, but the, so you got three different programs running out of this one building, doing general enhancements to the building, but I would assume that each section, each organization is going to have to set their sections up the way they want to set it up. So I'm assuming that's, I mean, not not a full gutting of the building, but the structure that's set in place, but still have to design it in a way that makes sense. So if you look at, so the ACE expansion money is available now, that's not, um, it's not a potential bond referendum. That money is already available now. That right? project's underway. And so, yes, the part, you know, part of what's making the expansion possible at the Highland Springs Ace Center is 
they had already begun kind of to spill into that main um, Highland Springs High School building. And so expanding that footprint with a, a portion of that building and really giving them a nicer entry, a more front facing entry. If you've ever tried to visit Highland Springs A Center, you'll struggle to find it, uh, the main entrance sort of between the parking lot. So giving it something a little more front facing uh, and reworking those spaces, that's part of that project. Uh, certainly the um, the uh, Education Foundation and grant funding, you know, will help us continue to enhance, for example, if we need to set up something like a clinic inside that full service community hub. But as far as getting it generally ready to open, you know, that's something we've uh, worked towards funding um, as well as the other portions of the building and making sure you know, security doors, all of those things are, are what they need to be. So, um... So the third piece with the achievable dream are so they are bringing their own money to the table to do their capital part of it. I would assume we have not uh, crossed that bridge yet because it's we're still very actively in planning. While we've identified that as a space for secondary programming, understanding we've just opened uh, our first sixth grade class, growing into the seventh grade class, uh, they have a, a fantastic home uh, nestled in the Fairfield Middle right now, which is good for kids to be with. Uh, clubs, extra, extracurriculars, knowing as that program grows, uh, having a separate, a secondary standalone is certainly a, a goal. Um, that's, that space has been carved out for that. I think it's still trying to understand what it could look like, what it would look like, the number of students we'd be potentially be serving there. Uh, and so we have uh, planned to make some initial investments, as I said, on some of the pieces around bus loops, entry, security, all of those things. But um, I think it would be a continued conversation with with the achievable dream partners about what this what would be needed in the space beyond to meet the need. So when we get when we start working on the Oak Ave complex, would you use one, you know, just in general? Are we using like one particular contractor to do the work on the building, et cetera? But and I know I know when generally I feel like that's the way we do things. So is that the way you would approach this piece? So the, the ACE part would be separate, handled through the, the group that's working on that project and the contractor there. Much of the other work is being done by our own uh, CNM staff. Okay. Uh, and so that's how we've handled that so far. All right. Another quick question. On slide number seven, uh, you were listing the potential projects. Uh, uh, no. With the slide seven? Yeah. Um, and I see Highland Springs Elementary as a renovation. I thought we were doing a rebuild there. So um, the the proposed CIP that we put forward uh, for the Board of Supervisors consideration listed that as a renovation based on our uh, preliminary uh, work and study. I mean, we certainly welcome conversation there. So. Um, do we have the slide? Uh, yep, that's it. You've got it. Yep. So um, when we originally did our pre-planning study and looked at each of the buildings, so what we're thinking about when we made this proposal was both the age and condition of the current building as well as programming. And so you can see that Longan and Jackson Davis both have capacity listed next to them. And so that's why those... Uh, were recommended as rebuilds because of the capacity needs and being able to do some expanded programmatic work, uh, bringing in more space, not just capacity for additional K-5 students, but understanding the pre-K expansion that's happening across uh, our county that leaves room for some pre-K classes. You know that pre-K has been uh, an, an ever-evolving uh, topic at the state level, and so more and more the push is to make uh, preschool available to more uh, individuals, and that's been what we've been working to support. So that's why that was proposed that way. The Highland Springs um, facility, as it was studied, was recommended for a renovation, given there weren't any additional capacity needs there or programmatic changes, and the look at the building indicated a renovation was uh, appropriate there, but certainly welcome any discussion about um, what might be needed or possible there. We'll uh... Talk about that later then, I guess. Um, uh, I'm almost done. Um, the Center for Environmental, Environmental Science and Sustainability uh, proposed for bond referendum. So let's, the, the voters, let's be optimistic that the voters will approve it. 
is there any conversation about um, timeline connecting it to the program at um, at Moran High School? So um, obviously we'd be anxious to to get going on that project as it's feasible and depending on how the bond uh, pans out and how funds are slated to become available. I mean, the good news is the environmental studies uh, program can launch right at Verina High School this fall. It'll be an incredible program, even in absence of this facility coming to life, because as I mentioned, we're going to get kids out in the field learning and we have a lot of places we do that now and we can continue to do it, for example, Deep Bottom Park and so on. We've got a lot of property available to us through, again, a great partnership uh, here that will allow us to get kids outside. But certainly the idea would be that once this center would be built, that juniors and seniors might spend their day solely there rather than on campus at Verina. Um, and that would kind of be their learning hub um, out in the field. And so that's if you think about bringing on our class now, uh, our freshmen this this next school year, uh, you know, it may be that, you know, as students approach their junior or senior year, they might this first class would have access potentially to something like that. If not incoming class, of course, uh, and then it would be available not just for the environmental studies program students as a hub, but for students all across at all grade levels to be able to come out and have some hands on learning experiences, teacher professional development, uh, really an incredible asset, um, but certainly a big piece of what we're trying to accomplish with the secondary program. Thank you. This last last question. Um, I know we're focusing on recruitment, retainment and awesome program to try to keep that going. How are your teachers doing now? Um, you know, this is a. We may never see another time like this in, in our lifetime. So, I mean, I know the impact, yes. the impact that I see on social media from our, you know, um, from our teachers, you know, it, it seemed like there is some struggle. Absolutely. To be emotionally, physically, etc. Uh, I appreciate you mentioning that because uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't, you know, have an opportunity to speak to the reality of what is I, I've used the word unprecedented so much. I feel like it's overused, but I can't think of it. It is truly unprecedented. The, the, the challenges um, all staff in K-12 uh, education are feeling right now. Uh, they're, they're incredible. And so and I think part of it is the ongoing nature of the situation. I mean, you think we're 21 months into constant change and pivoting and adapting. And um, I want to our team has been incredible from our bus drivers to food service, to our classroom teachers, to our building leaders, the challenges they've had to tackle and they continue to tackle um, with, with, you know, really with grace uh, to meet the needs of our community during what's a tense time. Um, it just continues to make me so proud, but it is not easy. And they're absolutely uh, the stress felt from any number of the challenges that have been presented, uh, having to learn to teach remotely, in person, teach kids who are quarantined remotely and in person. Uh, food service looks different than it ever has. You know, this idea of serving on a curbside and all of these different needs that have to be met. Um, it, it's just been incredible. You know, we've had um, driver shortages and so our, our drivers taking on extra runs and triple runs and, um, and wanting to provide good service to our students, you know, and, and timely service that 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 weighs on everyone, our, our school leaders trying to manage all of the elements of health and safety while still uh, providing a high quality education in person in our classrooms. I, we have made in person learning happen in a way we've never been challenged to do it before and we're doing it despite. Uh, the the curveballs that continue to be thrown our way, our teams looking out for kids and families and making sure we're creating the best in person learning we can for them. Well, I do want to say this um, shout out to you and your staff, central staff. I mean, I've personally heard about people from your administration going into classes, teaching classes, heard about school board members substituting and all of this stuff. Uh, it definitely does seem like everybody is on board trying to keep our schools open, kids safe, and keep on learning. So. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, guys. All hands on deck. We've got a great team. Dr. Cashwell, could you mention about how you came to make the decision about masks? Now sounds like a good time. Definitely a hot topic. I'm happy to touch on that. So uh, we did see uh, la uh, I 
of days we're running together last, last Saturday, Sunday, an executive order come forward uh, related specifically to masking and parental choice. And so we certainly weighed that um, executive order uh, along top of, of other, other guidance that we have and, and state law. And so, um, you know, we are holding with our current practice, which is reflective of state law. So. Uh, what seems to be the case here, and, and I want to be really clear, this is in no way Henrico County Schools pushing back personally on the governor or taking any kind of political stance. We're working to make sure we're maintaining our health and safety plans and doing so in accordance with the law and health experts. And so um, that is our position. And we did notify our community of that right away so there would not be any confusion of what our current practice is that masks are still required. Uh, certainly the basis of that being uh, related to the state law that's in place related to in-person learning, uh, often referred to as SB 1303. Uh, and so that's our current stance. We continue to await additional guidance and information, um, not only related to the legal uh, opinions and aspects there, I think as that evolves, as well as uh, very recently Friday night guidance came from the Virginia Department of Health as well, which is an additional layer of what we consider as we make our plans. So. Uh, certainly continue to weigh all the options. Um, we do have a health committee um, that uh, takes a good look at all of the latest guidance. And, you know, this is guidance is ever changing, not, uh, you know, from the CDC level and beyond related to quarantining and any number of aspects. We always examine that in partnership with the Virginia Department of Health and other experts and make rec they make recommendations to the administration and that's how we uh, create our plans. They also make recommendations to the board. Um, and so as we continue to examine things and the landscape would change that that team would be uh, making recommendations and, and we would be considering them. So current uh, guidelines stand uh, in absence of, of uh, a, a legal opinion on that piece as well, or I should say a legal judgment rather uh the legal opinion is that we're following the law as it is today thank you mm -hmm. mr schmidt you had some questions thank you man. thank you man i have three um i'll start with mac first uh i think i see hey, mac how are you good morning sir hey mac do we currently uh, you guys handle so many programs in the a center and ct program do we do you touch on hospitality and tourism management yet i know there's a gazillion topics you do and i know there's culinary but do you, do, do you have any resources for hospitality and tourism management yet as a, as a topic of study yes sir we do currently our hospitality and program is at holland springs ace center but with the new addition, the new building, we're going to really be able to vamp that program, ramp it up because we'll be able to add the culinary, the hospitality, the planning, all of it into one location. So as you start to look at the hospitality, the industry, it's, it's, it can't be taught in isolation. It's got to be all the programs brought together. And this is going to allow us that expansion to be able to do that. Awesome. That that's good to hear, Mac. Are you getting support off the top of your head? Do you know if you're getting support from the Virginia Restaurant Lodging Travel Association? Have you gotten outside agency support from anybody yet? Uh, as far as yes, um, that's one of the things we're very proud of in, in working with our architects and all. Every one of our, our programs, uh, we're actually bringing a business person to the table as we're planning out the spaces to make sure. That what we do in in the classroom will reflect the industry the in, in, industry needs ten years from now, uh, and and trying to revamp the old concept to where they think everything's going. That's awesome. That's a, a good good to hear, Mac. You guys, you guys do such a great job. I, I'm going to pass them on to my counterpart, Miss Kinsella, uh, to pass on to you. I had a meeting just a day or two ago with the executive director of the VRLT. And they're, they're, they're really going to see an increased push in getting into schools and providing not only curriculum support, educator support dollars to help with uh, some workforce development in that industry. As you know, Mac, workforce development is a topic across a million industries. Hospitality, tourism is suffering tremendously and they're, they're getting on board. I think, um, with getting into the high school level, and I want to make sure you have that guy's contact so that you can reap those benefits as well. Mac, I'll pass it on to Christy for you. Thank you very much. Um, 
on that topic, Mac, I know you know they do a good job in colleges and universities. You know, Virginia State has a program. There's a lot of programs in colleges, but if we can benefit on, on the high school level, I want to make sure you have all the resources that you need. I'll get it to you. Thank you. A uh, quick question on Tucker. Um, I don't know if it, is it just for Lenny or whomever. I know it's not in the Brooklyn District, but 50% of that school is Brooklyn District kids. So I just want to try to get an update on uh, timeline. I mean, I, I drive by there every day, and I know that there's a phase two going on. And I guess my, my main questions are, what's the future timeline? Where are they? What, what can we expect? And then parking and traffic. I, I, I just want to make sure I'm seeing it right. I drive by there, and that lot is packed. So. Is there anything we can do or what's the timeline? Where are we on Tucker? Well, I, I, right now, I think that we're still on schedule to finish up the phase two aspect of it and, and open up a new stadium and those students will be able to play you know, their first football, home football game there in the fall. Nice. Which would be nice. Um, obviously, with that phase two expect, uh, work that's being done, that is affecting parking right now. So once that's complete, the parking will improve as well. They'll go back through and redo that front parking lot. Um, by purchasing those houses on the corner lot there, that's going to help with the uh, Ease some of the uh, parking capacity problems that we've had there, even in the past. So, so what I'm seeing is is accurate. It's tight on parking right now yes. because of what's going on behind it. All that this summer, I would imagine, would make pretty good strides once you know kids get out of there a little easier to do some of that work. But it's moving every day. Yes, yes, it is. By September, we should be we should be okay. Uh, we should be better than we are. A, 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 a Tucker Grand Opening 2.0. 2.0. All right. So then plus the stoplight right there, the, the new additional stoplight that's been added right there on Home View and Pound Road as well. So that's awesome. Good help. Well, thank you. I just I just want to check in and make sure there's anything we can do to help with that. I know it looks tight as they're operating within a construction zone. So thank you. Uh, the, the last one I have is uh, probably Lenny for you as well. I just want to talk through a little bit about and and Dr. Cashwell. I love the the zone the the, the categorizing of the priorities of school construction. Right. So that. The chart of school construction by decades is remarkably helpful. Um, the current projects underway with existing bond money and then the future kind of broken out by that. that That's awesome. So thank you very much for that. It helps me categorize. I'm lucky because my counterpart in the Brooklyn district is on this every day. But when I get a chance to think about balance in Brooklyn specifically, I want to talk about Johnson a little bit. Uh, built in 1958. Uh, it opened as Bethlehem Elementary School in 1981, changed to Charles Johnson. But a 1958 build falls before a 1971 Dumbarton. It falls before, you know, even 1965 Long. And so if I could ask one thing, if, if we could, I know it might be the 10 and a half or 11th hour, but if we could take a peek at what's possible in the Johnson area. And I think there might be some constraints that I want to make sure that we talk through. There's a There's a little league right behind it. There, it's it's, it's kind of landlocked on that corner. I know in 2011 there were renovations done. I know there was a, there was bond money. I think it was five and a half million dollars, five point six million. I think the county put another three hundred thousand dollars or so into it. So six million dollars of dollars went to Johnson in 2011. But I think we can all agree that that six six million dollars is not going to cover a full what needs to happen there. And I, what I don't want to do is let Johnson get lapped or forgotten as we look in future planning. And you mentioned Glen Allen Elementary again, and certainly in the Brooklyn District, Dumbarton Hermitage High School rightfully is on that next step. Uh, I just I would ask for a deeper dive into Johnson and what we can do or what we should do. And if we can get that done so we can make sure we're considering it, uh, placing it in the right time, I think that would be huge. And I'll tell you what, one last thing, I'll let you go, Lay. I know you're probably queued up, but Libby Mill. Development is grow right. No, I mean, right a rocks throw from it and it's going to continue to develop and grow and better itself. The importance of Westwood right down Bethlehem across Staples Vale is important to this county. It's where folks are going. And then, you know, finally, the Brookfield potential the other way right towards broad. So that corridor, I have to my job is to keep my mind on where this county is going to go in that area and how it's going to affect you. And I, I Brookfield. Living Mill and Westwood is going with rocket fuel. And I want to make sure that we're really thinking about that corridor and what's possible at Johnson. I know it's on the highway. I know it's locked on Bethlehem. I know there's a little heat behind it. And I'm not saying a full rebuild. I just, I, what can we do with that? And I'll expect the answers now. My last piece of that is how many elementary schools are still campus style like that? I, I don't know. Um, 
I, I will tell you that we out of, out of our 72 facilities, 15 of them are campus style facilities. So 15 of 72. 15 of 72. And out of those 15, 11 have been remodeled, four of which are, are still up. Um, that, that would be uh, Central Gardens, which we have no programmatic need for right now. So we're not, that's, that was probably the number one priority school that would be on this list, but because it has no programmatic needs, there's no need to make put money into it. But that's Davis, Longan, and Virginia Randolph would be those other programs, and they are on this bond referendum coming up. So then that would make all of our campus health schools at least have been touched in some way or fashion. But we we have 15 facilities overall. Davis, Longan, and Virginia Randolph are the three campus style in addition to Johnson that are remaining. Yes. And we're addressing them almost immediately. Randolph's going to address them immediately because of some, some great work by schools and this and this manager and the, and the government. I, I, I can't say enough about the Randolph plan. Davis is on here and Longan, we all know that there's, Longan is a need number one for capacity. I get it. It's going to help the Springfield side tremendously. It has land, plenty of it. It's almost a quote unquote easy kind of decision there. That's probably even leads me more to say, can we take a moment and think about Johnson and how we don't forget that? Yeah, I, I know that I, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, I believe that Johnson was part of the 2005 bomb referendum. Yes, it actually touched in 2011. Yep. Um, as a, as a remodel, I know that we have a million dollars designated to go towards um, the part of the facilities that was added on um, back in 1996, that would be the cafeteria area and the main office area. There's a million dollars that's going to go towards that to the meals tax money that we're going to put into that and start looking at it. But obviously, as growth is going to happen, I mean, that's something that I, I feel like since I've been able to come aboard, I think that we uh, uh, try to reestablish a better line of communication with our planning department here within the county and start keeping an eye on these, these areas that are growing. That are going to, you know, that are, that are projected to start expanding even more so we can prioritize where we need to start looking at redeveloping areas. Um, I will say with Johnson, because I mean, I, I, the, you talked about parking issues. I mean, that was one of the first headaches that I think I inherited when I came into this job. Um, and then COVID kind of took that, that away from me. But those ball fields in that aspect would, would, would have to come into play as far as at least adding some expansion or a possible rebuild down the road, whatever it would be. So that would be something that we would have to talk with park and recs and little leagues and everything else. There's juniors there's I have a tremendous relationship with those folks. We put some time and effort into their fields. Um, Bethlehem Little League is a thriving organization, um, even in times when those organizations have a hard time thriving. Um, they're, a pride, they're a proud organization, um, but they also, uh, they see the future may not be in that corner. So, you know, I, I think you'll find a partner in me, you know, working with them. Um, and I guess my, my note is, and I wrote it down here yesterday, don't let those fields be a hindrance to the future of what you need to do with education, right? So we will work with our rec and parks folks. We'll work with Bethlehem Little League and we'll, we'll, we, will, we will make them whole. But don't let those fields on this overhead that I printed yesterday, don't let them pinch what you're trying to do with the future of the next 50 years for those elementary school kids there. You know, you have four campus style buildings for kids that are, you know, seven years old and I just want you to put smart minds to it and, and and ask tell me what we need to do there to to make that happen I know we're coming up on this manager I don't mean to throw it at you in January well let me uh let me ask um because I think I know where you're going with this uh Mr. Schmidt I know Brandon Hinton is on uh Brandon he was physically here in the room for a while yeah he's online okay can you turn uh, Brandon on, uh, Victoria? So what I'm going to ask you, Brandon, is you are working on a calendar for the school board and the board as far as uh, uh, referendum actions. And so what you'll see is because of the way early voting works now, at the very bottom, we're asking both boards to take action earlier. So I believe it's a February timeline because early voting starts in mid-September. So, uh, Brandon, are you on now? Yes. I'm on now. Yes, sir. Okay. So take us through that. Sure. And we'll go through this again uh, this afternoon, but, um, you know, part of the goal for this afternoon is to tie this whole referendum down. Uh, the 1st action item as, uh, as required by law. Is, uh, is an action of the school board and, and what that action is, is uh, it, the school board requests the board 
to adopt a resolution requesting circuit court to order referendum on the school's question. Um, our ask is that the school board consider that at its very next meeting on February the 10th. And uh, should that happen and should it move forward, the next action would be going to the board of supervisors at its next meeting uh, following that at February 22nd, uh, approving that consideration, but also requesting all items going to referendum. And then there's some action items at the court level they were uh, they're required to go uh, to have items on the ballot, but those are the two actions required by the two elected bodies. So February is when we we would vote on. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, because again, this is a um, this is a community conversation. I mean, we'll have teams from schools and general government going into Rotary's nursing homes and and. A lot of information that needs to be put out and normally on a November election, you know, we would start the effort earlier, but we have now early voting in September, so we can't assume anything. We can't assume that old calendar will work. As far as public information efforts, so the whatever we can do to. I don't know if uh, that does anything to you, but I think what Mr. Schmidt's talking about is reallocating. Uh, 26 and a half million dollars. Uh, you are in the second and third year of the referendum right now. I don't know, Dr. Cashwell, if you want to speak to that. And then ultimately, I don't think you're looking for a decision today. No, I, I, I that's, that's a great point. I, I just want to bring the thought to it. And I, I also want to state that I've been sitting in chair vice chair meetings for a year. And my apologies for recognizing this later in the game. I would have liked to have brought this to you earlier, but. In discussions with, with my counterpart and really in driving through the district and looking what great work has been done at holiday and how those kids are benefiting every single day from it. And the great work that was done at Highland Springs and the great work that was done at Tucker. It's just evident that what I see at Brookfield and Libby Mill and Westwood lends me to come to you today to say, please take a, a, a late peek at what we can do there. And it's just for me, and, and here's what I would the best balance and lifting of all boats in Brooklyn. So, like, how do we best evaluate what has been done at Holiday and how do we lift all boats in Brooklyn? And I, I do firmly believe that the great work that's been done at Glen Allen Elementary in the West to expand has in Brooklyn specifically was wonderful. What's being done at Glen Allen High School historically is wonderful. And the ACE improvements on her at Hermitage, wonderful. What's been done at Holiday, terrific. I just want to lift all boats and I just I would ask for consideration late in the game to think about what can be done at Johnson. And I'm, I'm going to interrupt here. Um, Marcy Shea has had her hand up. And um, first, I want to tell Ms. Shea that I drove by Tuckahoe Elementary School this morning and on their message signed out front, they said they're thinking of you. I thought that oh, really so sweet. sweet. Okay, so Ms. Thank Shea, you. go ahead Thank first, real quick. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and Mr. Schmidt, it's great to hear from you. I know you and I have spent um, quite a bit of time together in the last year in chair and vice chair meetings, um, talking, talking through this. And so, uh, and, and, and some of our, our, our bond projects and priorities and that sort of thing. And so, um, I just want to articulate for, um, kind of the benefit of, of, of the whole, um, you know, we have this timeline that you've pointed out, which is an, which is a great tool and it's a great visualization. We also have this study that we have done of all, all of our facilities um, as, as we look at um, not just when they were built, but what, what prior, what things look kind of like boots on the ground and where the greatest needs are. And so as we've been developing these bond projects, um, it's, it's, it's multi-layer, right? Looking at um, the build date, but also looking at what the actual building facilities look like and where the greatest needs are. Then we also have these capacity layers and that sort of thing. So everything's very layered. No one tool, I think, um, can let us just check, check, check in terms of the priorities. And so it really is teamwork amongst um, the five of us on the school board and the five um, of you all in terms of looking at um, what our priorities for this bond are. So I appreciate you uh, bringing forth what you are seeing in your district 
Um, and but just wanted to take an opportunity to, to articulate um, for all of our benefit to remember that we have um, a lot of these layers that we're looking at um, in terms of not only build date, but uh, the facilities report, the external facilities report that we use, um, as well as looking at capacity um, and, and how all of that comes together. And so um, we appreciate uh, dialogue and discussion and teamwork as we as we finalize that. Um, Mr. Thornton, you had some questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Cashwell, in particular to my colleagues on the school board, I want to say uh, Happy New Year to each of you and thank you for the job that you do because uh, education in the 21st century is really not easy, but it's going to be one of those challenging things. Uh, Dr. Cashwell, in your presentation, um, which was very, very uh, essential, and you gave us some very good information. Now, I, I have a few questions and a few observations. Number one, I would it be helpful to me if you were a little bit more specific on a challenge that you mentioned that we have, the whole country has, that is the teacher shortage. What are some things that we are addressing to count, see can we counterbalance that? Provide specifics and please that Francine Folden and Kenya Jackson from our human resources department who are really leading that charge are here. So I'm gonna let them uh, share some highlights. Thank you and good morning. One of the trends we have identified with regard to the teacher shortage is that more and more entering the profession are entering on a provisional license. So, so one of our efforts involves uh, supporting the teacher pipeline. We work very closely with our colleges and universities to obtain <clears throat> grants and funding to help teachers uh, defray the cost of obtaining their full licensure. Uh, we are working to provide um, opportunities within our division to provide classes ourselves. So having our own HCPS instructors teach these uh, individuals seeking licensure fully, uh, again, to, to defray the cost. So those are a couple of the efforts we're undertaking. We also, um, with, when we look at pipeline efforts, we work with colleges and universities uh, with respect to teacher residency programs. These programs offer individuals an opportunity to work on their degree to obtain full licensure, but also be in the schools and receive the firsthand experience. So, and my question real quick is, so does Henrico provide these grants? Or is this no, sir, no, ma'am, these grants are from external entities. Uh, the Department of Education provides grants. Uh, grant opportunities are also available through um, local colleges and universities as well. Thank you. And, and of course, Dr. Uh, Cashwell, in during my question, you know, I used to ask this each time we're together. Uh, I'm still uh, concerned about, as I look at the demographics of the county, that is the percentage of teachers there of, uh, to reflect the school population. And I don't know whether or not we've done any better on that. Have we? Or is that a challenge for us too? Any comments you can let me know about, about that? Dr. Cashwell, if I may continue. Thank you. Uh, we are continuing to work with regard to diversify, uh, diversifying the teacher workforce. A part of our issue, again, is the teacher pipeline. And so I go back to those pipeline efforts that we're working on uh, targeting um, not only all colleges and universities, but specifically HBCUs to try to find where the teacher candidates of color are and again, to target and entice those to come work with us in Henrico. 
Well, I, I think the pipeline process is a good process. But you also have to be aggressive on that process. And you always have to try to enlarge your number of places where you add into the pipeline. And so uh, I didn't hear too much about uh, inclusion and that pipeline about HBCUs. Yes, sir. We do target HBCUs. The enrollment in HBCU teacher uh, prep programs and across the nation, really, and all teacher prep programs is lower um, than what we have seen in the past. So one of the things we are doing to address that is we try to look beyond the teacher prep programs. So let's say, for instance, a person has a degree in biology but they were not in a teacher prep program. We endeavor to target individuals in other, um, let's see, disciplines, if you will, to entice them to teach. So you may have never thought about teaching before. So we're trying to look beyond the traditional means of attracting teachers um, to, again, to entice people to the profession. Thank you for that. I. Um... Also, I had a question about a facility that we used to have, and you know, facilities going up. But uh, is there any efficacy at all about thinking about the reuse of the Math Science Center? Yeah, we have uh, certainly uh, thought about how it could serve any programmatic need in the future. So, the facility itself, as you're aware, uh, is called Central Gardens, and it's been on lists before. We talked about that study that was done and uh, Chair Shea just brought it up. It might be, uh, I think at the top or as the second next to the Virginia Randolph complex for uh, being the most challenged as far as the facility and the investment needed to really make it um, viable, not just for teaching and learning, but for other uh, uses. So um, we currently don't have any programming planned for that facility. Uh, we certainly keep it in mind as we're thinking about, you know, growing programs and needs the division might have, but also understanding there'd be some investment on the capital side, depending on uh, what we might do there. So. I want to share an observation. Um, I've been in some of these meetings a good while now, and I kind of noticed as I listened to my colleagues and as I listened to the presentations, a lot of it. Uh, evolves around the monetary thrust, which is good because when you really think about it, Herico is one of those localities that is able to do that. And so we are very fortunate, which means that this is also um, a fortunate opportunity for the school system to improve. But um, one of my issues is that uh, I push that aside, which means that we don't have a monetary issue. Uh, we, we should be concerned about some other factors. I am concerned. Number one is that uh, what we have to be careful of is that we have five magisterial districts. And if we aren't careful how we handle that, you know, sometimes all schools are not considered equal. And that's a tough one. So, what I have always been striving for is to have one in RICO and one in RICO educational system. So, uh, as I hear my colleagues and uh, members uh, from the school board um, and some of the other uh, staff members talk about, you know, the monetary issues, I'm a little bit more concerned about the quality of education. So, I would like to have uh, from time to time, some data on what about the quality of education that our students are receiving in these educational institutions called our elementary school, middle schools, and high schools. That's very important. We, I never hear any talk about that. I hear about programs. I think that would be efficacious if we had a little bit more data on what about these students that we are producing. What about the global education of the students of the 21st century? And, and finally, you know, what will the students of 2025 finishing in Rico High School, what would that student look like? What do we propose that that student should look like? So 
I think the monitor view is critically important, but I also think the view of the type of student we are producing that's important. And let me send, send out to you another um, compliment. I'm glad to see that education is changing. I believe, and I'm only speaking for myself, that we probably used to take an elitist view of the offerings that we had, but now we're much more inclusive. We look at it other areas. I remember growing up uh, in Sister locality, you could go to high school and take um, tailoring. You just could take different types of shops. And then we got away from that. So I'm glad to see. So kudos to, to you, your staff. But we are going back to offering an education system that is much more eclectic and that we're taking many more trades, and that's very important. Everyone might not go to a four-year college anymore. So we really take a look at all that. So kudos to you for that. But uh, do share with me, though, some information, data from time to time. What is our student of 2025 is going to look like? What are our expectations? To me, uh, the billing is fine, but what we teach in that billing is even more important. I concur 100% and I uh, thank you for that observation and, and the feedback related to how we can best provide information uh, for you all for decision making and you're right facilities compensation plans all those things matter but what's the outcome for our students and so uh, we will we'll love to share more about uh, what I shared at the beginning of the presentation just some mini highlights but over half of our graduates are, are earning advanced diplomas I think that speaks to the quality of education they're receiving uh, the number of students graduating on time and 90 percent uh area and then really thinking about are they life ready um, is important and so we do have a henrico learner profile that seeks to say what are the characteristics we want for our graduates and would love to share more about that in the future because i think that work is really driving the outcomes we see with lots of scholarship money being offered industry certifications being earned we are graduating students who are well prepared uh, and those are a few data points uh, I shared at the beginning, but certainly many more we can point to and would not pretend to say we don't have a lot of work to do in that area. We want to see those numbers even grow, but uh, I think that those do represent um, some some data points that speak to the kind of uh, graduate we're producing. Just just a couple of real quick. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, say a lot of what a couple of the other board members have said, number one, thanks. Uh, it was it was amazing to hear that with the coming out of the holiday and, and the high volume of, of COVID cases that you yourself, Dr. Cashwell, put on your boots and and, and went into the trenches and, and we're, we're teaching as well as uh, board members. Uh, I think that is remarkable and we really on this side, appreciate the team effort that that speaks volumes. Um, Lenny, I have a couple of two for you. Uh, number one, of course, Mr. Schmidt took on getting an update on on Tucker. Is there anything that we need to push to get that going? Not right now. I mean, if it was, I, I would be the first to reach out and say, can you, can, can you get some help in this area? But I mean, it seems to be going. That plan. I mean, we took off a very good relationship with Dr. Valerie. Um, I think they kind of bought into a team concept of getting that job done. Um, and they've been very systematic of going through it. Unfortunately, the area that's being done in that phase two is affecting the parking piece of it. There's no way around it. Nothing so, to do with that, right? I'm just more interested that they keep it on, on schedule. Yes. Okay. Uh, number Two, and this is something that, that you and I did when you first came on. Uh, we we have and looking at you all's forecasting for the future is is also a bright light. Um, we've never seen stuff coming out of schools that's looking 10, 15, 20 years. It's usually one or two years. So thank you for moving that forward so we can all look way beyond a year and 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 get things going. Uh, you and I took a ride so we could review what was going on in, in, in my district and what you proposed would help alleviate. And, and I see a bunch of that coming through. 
um, I think it's time for us to take another trip, uh, another, uh, if you will, breakfast Saturday. Uh, and that's what I was going to say. And I think we should invite Mr. Uh, Schmidt along this time. Uh, we, we, so you know, Dan, what we did was, um, so Lenny could get an absolute feel for what was already on the book, what the land use plan said, what is coming in in the future um, that we see before they see, uh, helped him, I think, formulate and get an idea of, of area. Uh, we, I still have some ideas with in regards to the elementary school, but also we are right there now on the cusp of of where the high school would go and the the school park complex uh has has now been designed and and i think you really need to see the way that would lay out so and the best way is boots on the ground so if if you wouldn't mind getting getting with me and and dan i'd love to have you Come along and spend half a day in your district as well. You said breakfast. <laughs> I'm buying. All right, I'm in. <laughs> um, and please, just a just a Saturday. We'll start just like we did early in the morning, have breakfast, and then then hit it and run Absolutely. through 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 the area. Um, and last, I want to thank you. I get with storms. The manager will tell you. I get out on the road and, and I start looking and I'm talking to public works guys saying, what about this? What about this? What about this? I think I drive them crazy, but, and, and they entertain me by saying, Mr. Graham, we got this coming. And, and so it's, it's fantastic. Um, and I drove through the school by the schools in the district. And I said, there's nothing staged. This is the last story. And he said, I'm a little concerned about that too. About four hours later, he calls and he said, don't know how the, who the new guy is over there. <laughs> don't know how he did it. But they're all cleared. And I said, you're kidding me. And I went back through and sure enough, keep doing what you're doing. Really? We, we have a great team in our facilities group. Um, obviously, led by Susan Moore and, and, and the people that work here. Mm -hmm. um, it's trickled down into the schools with the major supervisors and so forth and just that constant line of communication. Um, it's been good, and I would also like to communicate if I can, you know, like the Henrico Police Department. I know that we we received benefit from the Watch Commander at four thirty in the morning. Um, that was very helpful um, to determine on some of the decisions that our superintendent has to make. So I am thankful for the partnership there and public works and, and health and clearing roads and just those things that they did. So thank you. No huge difference. And last one's for you, Dr. Cashwell. Two years ago. It was all the argument and and how can you do what you're this you're you're destroying the schools by getting rid of the math and science and and this the, the STEM program and I was being lit up Mickey was being lit up uh, Mr Nelson was being lit up we all you know were the STEM and you said we've got it I haven't been on top of you to see, but I haven't gotten any calls saying schools have dropped the ball. So obviously you you weren't kidding, you had it. Our, our schools have it, they're incredible. And the programming that have been designed to embed those concepts um, more into our schools, and of course working with partners uh, have been highly successful. We still know that um, there are any number of touch points to other organizations that provide uh, students opportunities through science fairs to compete at the state uh, and national level. And, and we've still had a great pipe, pipeline and great success there. So um, yeah, really proud of the, the math science uh, that's embedded all through the school division, touching uh, many more students. Okay, thank you. And that was a thanks to you because if, if the other board members remember, that was a very, very, very hot topic. And uh, uh, I wasn't sure you were going to pull it off, but obviously you did. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kinsella, you wanted to talk to me. 
Yes, and um, Mr. Brand, I'm excited that you've invited Mr. Schmidt um, on the field trip in uh, in the Brooklyn district um, with Mr. Pritchard so that you guys can also, just following up on the Johnson conversation, um, knowing that since January 1st, 2020, uh, when I came into the seat, I've heard a lot about the safety of the Johnson parking lot and constituents wanting more of an investment in that school. Um, so I appreciate Dan. I didn't think it was possible from our con from our prior conversations about the little league, but apparently you've done you've done some work, and I just really appreciate our partnership and trying to figure out um, what's best for the Brooklyn district um, and Henrico schools as a whole. Um, we're not only stewards of the resources, but we have a fiscal responsibility. And um, ironically, constituents in recent weeks have really spoken up about the campus style. As you know, we've all prioritized health and safety during the pandemic. And this is just safety of a different, different sort. It's what we used to think of as safety and being safe in our schools. Um, and the original age of the building does meet the criteria that Mrs. Shea mentioned. Um, so that's that's interesting. I look forward to hearing more after your field trip with Mr. Brandon and Mr. Pritchard. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. You like, might touch on it more this afternoon conversation because it's not adding money to the potential bond. It's just reallocating it. Um, we already have twenty six and a half million dollars um, that we're talking about. So thank you for that. I just have one more question. I'm reminded of a question that a constituent asked me. It was brought to my attention as it relates to um, CARES Act spending. How are you guys doing with that? And particular money designated for special, special education kids. So uh, the um, ESSER and CARES, uh, there's, there were a couple of pots of that money. We have worked to create spending plans for all of it uh, that meet any number of needs, for, but most specifically uh, needs related to uh, post-pandemic and current pandemic conditions uh, with learning. So uh, big investments in our expanded summer school, which we launched this past summer, getting kids, uh, opening it to more kids, continuing plans for the next few years to fund that funding additional uh, stipends for teachers who lose their planning time to cover classes, for example, um, bonuses for drivers, you know, all kinds of things we've been able to fund with that money, not to mention um, uh, PPE, cleaning supplies, and keeping those supplies current in all of our schools. And then specifically, I would uh, say when it relates to uh, special education, I think of the facilities, so being able to put into uh, that grant the proposal that the facility, uh, which uh, we know Virginia Randolph serving some of our exceptional education students uh, was in need of improvements uh, from a health and safety standpoint, uh, as well as thinking about the programmatic needs. So, of course, that's a, a large investment uh, in that third ESSER pot that is designated for that project, which we've been able to uh, get underway. And so there, there was no individual, so that individual tried to deal in. And that's a big a long term piece, which is something that is more focused. So ultimately, no restrictions came from the federal government as a, as it relates to how you had to spend the money. Oh no, there there were a lot of those, <laughs> and there are a lot of those. There are very specific use cases for the money, uh, and grants that have to be approved through the Virginia Department of Education and screened that meet. Uh, ultimately, the requirements for how the monies can be spent, uh, a lot of HVAC improvements, uh, those kinds of things. Um, like I said, PPE, things specifically related to pandemic response. And, and of course, that, that uh, addressing learning loss, learning gaps, and that would be all students, including uh, special education students that wouldn't be specialized in that way, but really just uh, bringing in uh, more assessment tools, teaching tools, those kinds of things, more remediation, more tutoring. Um, those kinds of uses. I just had uh, one question. Um, Ms. Ogburn, did you want to say a few words or Mr. Cooper, Ms. Ogburn first? Oops. Oh, she has. Not sure if I'm, un I'm unmuted now. Thank you for the opportunity. I just want to thank you all for as 
once again, having the opportunity for the uh, for all of us to get together and talk about such important issues and uh, echo what um, Mr. Brandon said about planning for the future. I think we're um, we've taken a different direction for that. And I think it's so important for planning for schools, but also on the county side to know what's coming. And, um, you know, we've we've changed our focus a bit. And I, I think that helps both sides, but I want to just, just a brief thank you and, and hello to everybody. Wish we were all together. We will be one day. Um, Mr. Cooper and then Ms. Atkins, Mr. Cooper. Well, I'll um, just again, echo the sentiments of my peers. Um, Happy new year to everyone. Um, thank you for the continued partnership, um, collaboration and commitment from the county side um, for funding, um, as well as giving us the ability to um, offer um, the type of education that we do to our um, constituents, as well as the um, concessions we make for our staff and just a Herculean effort on everyone's part to to navigate these waters um, in this uncertain time. But I do believe that we'll come out stronger, we'll come out better because of it. And it helps to have partners on the other side from the manager and the board of supervisors um, who 100% uh, are aligned with what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So again, thank you again for your, your partnership, your collaboration, and your commitment to uh, Henrico County Public Schools. Ms. Atkins, do you want to say something? I do. First and foremost, good morning. It's wonderful to be here and to be able to see all of you, whether we are in person or through the screen. Uh, it's just important to acknowledge our presence and the opportunities we have to collaborate as well as ask tough questions because we're working together because the goal is always to move forward. The hard part is how. And it's a privilege uh, to be able to solve those uh, issues and challenges because we'll see the reward in our communities and our children and our families. And I'm grateful uh, for the Board of Supervisors and Mr. Vitakas and his team and looking at our budget. Uh, and also, as Mr. Thornton said, you know, we want to look at the monitor, but we also want to look at the quality and making sure that we try to find the right balance um, as we move in Rico County forward. And we're doing it in a wonderful way under extenuating circumstances. So thank you so much for everything that you do. The floor is yours. Hey, Ms. Shea, I know your two words, Quackus and Middle School, right? Oh, that's three. <laughs> that's right, Quackus and Middle School. Glad to see it on the Bond Project. Happy to um, work together to uh, get it across the finish line. And so um, it's going to be such a critical project. Um, but um, thank you all for um, accommodating um, us virtually. Um, I look forward to when I can be uh, back in the room where it happens soon. Um, and I appreciate um, all the well wishes that you all have um, sent my way so far. I'm feeling um, strong and positive and taking things a day at the time and um, appreciate um, our team on the school side and also um, y'all's team and being able to continue um, serving um, Henrico County. Thank you, Marcy. And Marcy, uh, it's not just go team. It's we're keeping you in your hearts and prayers. Please remember that. We want you to come back, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, if that is everything, I think we've covered everything. Uh, we are running a little bit over, but I think we did cover everything in great detail. And unless someone else has something else to add. How many people did we have viewing Victoria? 78. 78 people were viewing this. Thank you very much for those of you who were and who have been watching. And if you do have questions, please leave them in the chat room and we can possibly get to them later or we will certainly respond. Thank you very much. And we will adjourn just for a few minutes and be back with economic development. Thank you. Thank you.